Here we are, guys. We are here. We have 153 people here. I'm assuming you're all here to see the bitches, but I'm assuming you're actually really here to see the beast. This is the Psychor Beast. You probably have seen their friendly faces on YouTube. Uh, they are the bomb ass best at explaining ABA concepts. Um, if you have a question about anything, they know the answer, guaranteed. Um, so the <laughs> <laughs> you also probably heard them on our Behavior Bitches podcast. Um, Ryan came on and spoke about sex. Now you guys are all going to go listen, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, and then we had Brad come on about being a mascot. From yeah. leather to spandex. <laughs> yes! <laughs> exactly. Those two podcasts kind of go together in a weird way, but that's not about the <laughs> yeah, They really do, depending <laughs> on what you're into. <laughs> You combine them, it becomes a furry convention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so we are. I'm excited to get started. Um, so. So basically what happened, this kind of collab stemmed from a lot of emails from students um, just wanting more resources on stimulus equivalents. And um, I wanted to listen to the needs of our students, as always. Yeah. And um, I know that these guys are way smarter than us. and so. I asked them, you know, how they feel about coming on and doing a free class, especially in the times we're in now, where free is good. And guess what? In stimulus equivalents, you get shit for free. So that's a good way to focus. Um, yeah, um, yeah um, always, right? That just came out of my mouth. I have no idea where that came from. But um, so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Ryan and Brad um, agreed to do this with us. We're so excited. So stimulus equivalents, I'll let Ryan kind of take over now. I think he's going to share his screen. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Well, um, I was trying to figure that out a second ago and it kind of blocked everything out of you guys. So I'm going to try to play it on a different screen here and see if it will still share. And now um, it will show you as the speaker still. So if you press. There's, you could do both. Okay, whatever makes you feel sexier, Ryan. You know I support oh, that. Oh, I'm where I'm. I'm all about the wearing black today. So me it's, too. Which I didn't think was going to like. Too. Yeah, I tried to do a virtual background, but my computer doesn't meet the requirement. So oh. sorry. Yeah. Um, Upgrade. Um, so what we've done, Brad and I have worked diligently over the past 48 hours, um, studied all of the books that we have available, of which is not the newest Cooper. Um, and there's a reason we don't actually want to get into all the stuff that's in the newest Cooper. We, we have the oldest Cooper and the, old, and the second oldest Cooper. Um, so but we dug into all sorts of textbooks, and you can't see them, but they're over there. Um, we went, really went to the source, which was EAB. Okay, so experimental analysis of behavior, which is where stimulus equivalents developed out of, right? So it was research in that particular field that led to the training that everybody does every day. So we said, where do we want to go with this? And I've taught this before. Brad learned it from me incorrectly because I taught it horrifically. Um, and we've all good now. fixed ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? It's all good now. It's all good now. Yes, exactly. Because yeah. we work together now um, and you make it better. So we literally went through every book that I have, every book that Brad has, and we said, can we boil this down into a few set of slides that people can take home and understand? We think we got it. So from where we want to go, we just kind of want to get into the presentation of what stimulus equivalent is. This is probably a regurgitated lecture from 16 faculty members that you all have had. It's probably not much different than anything you've seen before. So, um, but we'll take a look. Um, Brad will jump in and out of here and make comments and interrupt me as we go. Uh, Liat and Casey do the same thing. Um, feel free to ask questions, you know, follow the rules on managing the questions over in the chat window um, on that side of my screen or that side, I don't know how it works on your guys' stuff. So um, that said, should we just jump in? People? Yeah, Casey I wanted to give a quick um, verbal, um, I post it in the chat, but if you um, want to, when Ryan shares his screen, it'll come up big, but so you might not want to pin his vocal video, but we'll see how that goes. But it, like in this case right here, if you wanted to just see Ryan or just see Brad or whatever, in the top corner of his picture, there's three dots. You can hit pin video. That'll keep his video big or whoever's video you want to be big. But I would suggest one of these. Unless we go big. like this. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I see a lava lamp in person. Yeah. <laughs> Super cool over there. All right, um, let's do it. So when, when we do share a screen, you can actually, it's going to take up your whole screen, but you can minimize that and bring it back down and still play with your emails and check board and have in the background, um, whatever you need to do. Um, so here we go. Let me see if I can share this thing. Also, there I will go. say I spent this morning reading chapter 17 of Cooper third edition. It's an entire equivalence based instruction chapter and it is 
insanity. So Good. I'm glad Good. that we're not focusing on that today because I need to study it, to be honest. Yeah. With you. Uh, and, and that's something that we would love to come back and talk about. Sorry, Brad, yeah. go ahead. No, we were going through uh, the second edition of Cooper and they gave you about a page and a half. And I was like, what type of crap is this? Shit. <laughs> it is shit. So we had to get other resources. Uh, and I think that uh, we can just start with that before we get into the presentation that talks about stimulus equivalents. But that's an important point. The field changes. If you go back 30 years, 20 years and look at old textbooks, stimulus equivalence is like that much. It's, it's not even in the ABA textbooks. It's irrelevant. Right uh, from the ABA perspective, because they were focusing on completely different approaches to habilitation you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So they don't have that in there, right? The literature on stimulus equivalents is old. Um, you can go, I mean, I was pulling references from 89. I was pulling references from the 60s. Sidman was talking about this stuff in the early 90s. So, so there's, there's a ton of EAB literature on stimulus equivalents and how you do it. The application of it, I don't think really started to become popular for the last, into the last 15, 20 years. And we found out what you can do with it. Then you get the Hayes folks and the RFT and all that stuff. And you start to come up with some new theory. And I'm going to put that word out there heavily, theory, about how equivalence may be playing a role um, in um, language development or part of language. And you get into that RFT stuff. We're not going there today, like, at all. Like, the reason that I don't want to go there is because I, I know about this much about RFT when I want to know about that much, right? So I'm not there yet on my RFT stuff, which is why Brad and I don't have videos on it on our channel because we're just, we're reading stuff. I've got, we've got some really unique references that aren't published on RFT that we're working on. Um, and we're just not ours, other people's that built the, the RFT models. We got their original writings. Um, so we're looking at what the heck all that stuff is and trying to understand it in a way that we can present it. So we're not there, which is why we're not including it. So this is old school stimulus equivalents. Then at the end, we'll talk about how you can apply it. Brad, did you have anything you want to add to that? No, I just thought we are working on it. Uh, we like to do everything with, uh, despite the looseness of our presentation, to at least be detailed and organized in some capacity. Uh, so okay. we can kind of at least meet you in the middle where it's not just complete smart ass all the time. Uh, at least it's relevant. Uh, so we were having a discussion about how we would like to do videos on that kind of topic going into the RFT thing, but that's it, it's coming. Right now we're here. Yeah. And to do this stuff, to make it fun, presentable, and really short, we have to be able to do it accurately and do it well. And that takes time and, and practice. And we do it to each other. We do it to our family members. Our family members hate us because all we talk about is this, but whatever, like they, they get used to it. My kids are behaving like this by training now. Yeah. <laughs> like, She's yeah, still here, it's, it's fine. Cool one, Dad. I'm like, yeah. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go. Uh, can everybody, so I'm assuming everybody can see the screen because it's green on my end. So if I'm doing this, it's because I'm looking at the screen about what to say. It's not that I'm ignoring you and looking at my cat. So uh, I have to turn away from the camera to see what's on the screen. So, uh, of course, it's now not going to do anything. Stimulus equivalence. There we go. There we go. That's it. Lecture's over. All done. See you guys. <laughs> done. That's it. <laughs> That's all there is. Um, so um, stimulus equivalence is really just stimulus control. It's a special case of it. It's a special procedure to get there. And it's a special procedure to test to see if you even have it. But it really is, at its core, stimulus control. Now, there's more to it, obviously, okay? Um, but it is easier than you think, I promise you. So the, the core structure behind stimulus equivalence is dreadfully simple. Um, the application of that gets a little trickier. Some of the implications of it gets even trickier than that. So let's move on. All right, so reflexivity. The word reflexivity literally means reflex, which literally means same. A equals A. Y'all have heard of this before. Brad has rallied against this repeatedly in, in our videos, and we even have a song about it, but um, it is really matched to sample, um, and, and that's present a sample match to it. Okay, so we're gonna get into how the structure of all of this works and how you train it and how you test for it. But what we want you to remember is that doing what we see here, what you're gonna see here in these videos, or this, this little lecture, is drastically different than what it means to have the ability to do this for a human organism or non-human organism or those types of things in their world. So we're gonna simplify it um, for what it really is and how it was done in the laboratories. And there's actually variations on it. We're not going into those variations. We're doing the really simple stuff. Um, and then we'll talk more about the application and things. So it's, it's gonna sound really simple, but it's actually really tricky. So, but it is only matched the sample at its core. So let's start with reflexivity. 
So we're going to have a sample. We're going to have a match that the organism chooses from. And I use the term organism on purpose because I don't want behavior analysts that I work with to only think about humans. Um, for me, being a core, you know, starting out in the core EAB world and the ABA world at the same time in graduate school, to me, I was looking at those commonalities among between species. And uh, some stimulus equivalents um, are, uh, some, some layers of that are equivalent across species. So to me, I always focus on the term organisms. Uh, it keeps my head in the game as a behavior analyst and not as, wow, this is uniquely human. Like, I don't, like, that's not my thing. Brad hates it when I go there like, well, but that's uniquely human and we're not gonna talk about that. Um, so I don't, I don't go there. So anyway, so we got a sample, we're gonna match to it and we have a reinforcer. So here's our sample, <clears throat> Heineken. We're going to call it bear. But so our sample is bear, okay? That was and a joke. We have to choose, what's that? That was a joke. Heineken is to a beer. <laughs> now, I, I can say <sighs> after living in Afghanistan, we used to drink expired Heinekens, which are really, really good. Fresh Heineken. There's also, there's also a strong MO there, Ryan, let's be honest. <laughs> but, but yeah, it was illegal in the yeah. country, so how did you get it, right? Yeah, this could be it. Anyway, be like, get back to this. <laughs> back to the lecture. Okay, so um, sample is a Heineken, so it's a picture, right? Um, so I hope everyone would choose the same picture. This is reflexivity, match the sample, right? So Brad, in practice, this is like table work, right? So what would you do with the match? Uh, like the person gets it the first time, what would you do the next time? Uh, it depends on the skill level of the kiddo. Uh, sure. Most likely just a full physical prompt, hand over hand kind of action going on. Sure. Uh, either that or if the and kids, prompt dependent, you look at gestures, but now we're getting into practice and away from the example. So. But no, that's good. That's what we want to talk about. So even yeah. with a reflexivity example, which is drastically simple, there's still layers that you have to think about. Think about preferences, side preference. In non-humans, you're doing this in a cage, in a cage, in an operant chamber, they'll develop a side preference. If I set this thing up this way, the rat will just choose right every time. Yep. It'll That's just learn that uh, it's the stimulus on the right side. Boom, yep. boom, 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 like Brad said, prompt dependent. Um, so then, so you rotate the, the image and you put it in different locations. So the organism learns that it's yeah. really clear you, that you're trying to match. That's imperative. If you start noticing kids to pick always the same side of a table or same size of a pec board, you got to start mixing it up. Otherwise, all your other learning is going to be just screwed. So what uh, type of stimulus good. prompt is that? Positional. But it's there really side bias. Yep, side preference. Yeah. So, yeah. sweet. Boom, shout out. You guys rock. <laughs> um, and then reinforcement, of course, you're in the reinforcer for only one of those particular responses. Um, so, uh, and I'm assuming it's positive reinforcement because we're delivering food in a food hopper or giving the kid a chip or, hey, good job, or what, whatever it is. Um, so, w whatever you're doing for your positive you're reinforcement. You're not going to give children beer. Yeah. Okay. Not that specific reinforcer there. Define children. <laughs> is there an age cutoff here? Because yeah, um, I think well, we might have violated some rules. Those. I think if this, you have to give your kid beer, you can. No, it's like this isn't Ireland or Wisconsin, wow. so we could use food droppers and it would work, right? <laughs> okay, so let's move on to symmetry now. Some of you get stuck around something. I got stuck around it. Brad's been stuck on it. Hell, we were even talking about it last night. Going, I think we're stuck on it. Uh, the 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 issue that you hear in Cooper all the time and you read all the time is it has to be untrained. Yeah. Pay close attention to some of the language because there are training components, but to demonstrate the equivalence that the demonstration has to be untrained. So, so watch what's going on. So now we have symmetry a B and now, um, so we're going to make a with some stimulus a equal. And so I put my hand on my chest so you can so it's more salient, right? So some stimulus a match some stimulus B. Okay whatever those are. So we're gonna play around with that. Uh, we're gonna do the training phase first. This is where you do the training. So don't think that A and B are autumn, just magically gonna appear as being linked together. There's several ways you can do this. You can do it operantly. You can actually do it classically. That's an interesting way to do it. There's a classical link that you can do here as well too, uh, through stimulus, stimulus pairings uh, without reinforcements, but we're not going there right now um, because that gets uh, really confusing. So here we go, same procedure. We're gonna put up a beer or Heineken, if you want to call it a beer. Um, and then we're going to match to the written word. Pop beer or wine, of course, it's the beer, right? So it's not wine, uh, it's definitely not pop. It's probably closer to pop than it is beer, but whatever. Um, so we, for the purposes of the example, we'll stick with calling it a beer. So now you do this, you go through all this prompt dependency stuff, you go through the side preference stuff. For those playing at home, stuff. we probably would have moved where the word beer was for this test, so we don't develop what we were just talking about. But yeah. we had five minutes to make a free lecture, 
So same format for every slot. And, and we literally left it over there. You know, I, I thought about that as we were building these slides and it's like, God, do we move it around? It's like, we could, but to understand it, it's really simple just to <laughs> follow we, this nice little pattern. Right? We could, but I need um, coffee and to brush my teeth, so no. Right, it, yeah, I had to get dressed, and I was like getting dressed like one minute before the presentation. <laughs> Ryan, are you? Kids from, are still getting food. Are you from the Midwest? Where are you from again? M mainly Spokane. Why? What, uh, which okay. is Eastern Washington. Pat, where are you from? You were from Spokane, right? No, I'm from Minnesota, and pop Minnesota. is like I've only heard it in Minnesota. I've never heard anyone call it pop outside of that state. Yeah. <laughs> okay, for those of you that don't know, it's called soda. <laughs> soda pop, or if for those of you that are from the south, it's just Coke. Yeah. Accurate. <laughs> so, uh, All the things you learn. As yeah. an example, there you go. <laughs> So that would, Catherine, that would be fun. We could develop this as a stimulus equivalent training about why pop, co pop, Coke, and um, soda are all the same thing. Um, so true. And in Montana, it's soda pop. So yep. that, that's, yeah. Anyway. All right, so we good on this one. I can't see anybody other than a couple of people, a couple of people nodding their heads going, oh yeah. Uh, all right, so now we're doing the A equals B thing, right? So some people get confused in Cooper and say, well, you can't train that. Yes, you can. Here's what you don't train, you ready? The test. Notice we flipped it around. We're not testing for A equals B. We already demonstrated that. Will the organism figure it out that if I put B at the top, will they choose A? And if they demonstrate this, if they reliably choose the Heineken, now, of course, I put the reinforcer up there, but you wouldn't, like, you don't necessarily reinforce it. If they choose Heineken here, <laughs> then they've demonstrated symmetry, okay? You don't have to, you can stop. You don't have to reinforce them. Um, the secret is that you do after they've demonstrated it a few times because you're going to lose the response if you don't. So you do have to connect it. Um, but in, in Cooper, they're going to tell you um, you don't train it and you don't. So you, so you can skip that reinforcement line here. I put it there so you know that if you want to continue on, you would reinforce this particular response. Um, but again, you don't have to. The organism will stop right here. They'll choose beer readily. Like this is a, a most organisms will um, demonstrate this. If you do your training right early on, the A equals B, if you train enough exemplars, for those of you that are paying attention. So if you train enough examples of beer, like, and you could even generalize things in there. So you could do different types of beer. You could write beer in different ways. You could use different fonts. You could do all sorts of different things. So people learn to see beer in different Real beer, different perspective. Real beer, yeah. We <laughs> wouldn't necessarily use Heineken um, uh, in Corona because Corona jokes are just going to happen, folks. Um, so, so you would play around with all of that stuff um, and make sure you generalize the oh, the type of beer that you're using. Um, is it in a bottle? Is it in a can? Is it poured in a glass? All of that stuff you want to produce that response of the word beer, right? So they know the same thing. You connect all that stuff. So if you did that well <laughs> and you did a really good job at that level, this is going to Rats do this all the time. Pigeons do this all the time. No issue. Dogs, cats, whatever. Um, Non-human primates knock this one out of the park. Like every species does this basically. So this is not something that's really special. Um, and it's easy to do in the lab. So I'm gonna put that down there just because you got the right answer. Good job. Again, there's two layers here. If you're just trying to demonstrate symmetry, you would not provide the reinforcers. You say, hey, the kid got it. Sweet. Nice. We're done. So the kid knows how to uh, knows B equals A. Transitivity gets a little trickier. Now, I played around with the, the, the visual here just to get you to focus on salient stimuli. We're going to start with, so this is ABC, right? So A equals B equals C. So eventually we're going to get to A equals C and C equals A. You get the idea. So we're going to start with training phase one, which is just AB. You all already know this one. A, B, earn your reinforcers. Okay. This is the repeat of the other early, earlier slides, just a copy and paste. So transitivity, now we're going to do B equals C, which is, again, just a... Um, Case of symmetry. The word beer, but we're going to connect it to something new. The spoken word beer, right? We're going to train this one. This is one where you get reinforced for because you have to connect the word beer, the written word beer with the sound beer, right? So you have to connect those two things. If you don't, you can't do this phase. Test. This is where the organism demonstrates the first phase of symmetry. So if they get this right, again, you don't necessarily have to reinforce. Um, that would demonstrate that they learned it is if they get it right, right? So sample is the beer, the match. You've never paired the picture of beer with the sound of the word beer. If they get it, 
awesome. They learned, they have stimulus equivalent, they have. They're demonstrating stimulus equivalence. Now we would call that an equivalence class. They've demonstrated an equivalence class of beer to beer, right? So um, this leads us to some interesting questions about what are they learning, but we'll come back to that here in a minute. So um, again, I put the thumbs up there. You wouldn't necessarily reinforce this. Certain cases you would, certain cases you wouldn't, but you're not done yet. You have to test the reverse, going back to the direction, which is did they get C equals A? And the answer is, or is that beer? Again, they've never even seen this as a stimulus to sample, as, as, as the sample stimulus. So they have, like the organism is really making some jumps. Now, some authors and some people will call this a, these, the, the transitivity level derived relations, okay? So they derive the relation between these two things, okay? So eh, it's a bit cognitive interpretation for my likes, but I get what they're trying to say. The organism is making these jumps cognitively. They're using their biology and they're making the jumps. They're not being specifically trained. So beer, of course, they're gonna choose the, the bottle of Heineken. So, uh, and again, you wouldn't reinforce, it has to be untrained or in order for it to be genuinely stimulus equivalent, all right? Um, but there you go, that's the correct answer, so. <sighs> Questions on that so far? We've got like one more slide, but it's a big one. 60 chat messages, I'm freaking out. What's going on, Doc? So I, I just wanna tell you guys something really quickly. If anyone's like new and learning this, um, of the reason as to why we care that people have stimulus equivalents, or, or are you going to get into that? Yeah, well, go of, for it. Talk. We're a team here. Yeah. All right. So, see, we support our work husbands. Um, so over here, I, I chose you, Ryan. By the way, Casey got Brad. You weren't on yet. <laughs> okay. Oh, I see. So, um. We, especially, okay, so, I mean, especially with autism, but just in general, a lot of these people we're working with, right, we can't possibly teach every combination someone's going to run into, right? So, like, here's one shade of red. If you look at this, it's a little bit different of a red, right? I, like, so if people are going to see a slightly different color red, I still need them to know it's red. So we teach stimulus equivalents so that people could make these free, um, derive relations, right, to figure out, oh, then I guess this must be considered a shade of red too, right? So we're doing that all the time because when we teach for stimulus equivalents, people are able to pick up on these free training essentially, like, oh, well, if that's red and that's red, I guess that's red. Um, and so that's where all these equations come in. Did I miss anything there? Just. Uh, uh I think that we're we're combining a couple of things. You could yeah. de you definitely want to make sure that you have stimulus generalization. So doing right. those different versions of red, right? So um, I, you know, today is the, this last month or so has been an amazing thing for behavior analysts because number one, they have these curves, right? We're talking about flattening the curve all over the world, right? So you get this really steep curve and this this flatter curve. That curve is a generalization gradient. So if your curve is super steep like this, red only means one darn thing. You better teach multiple exemplars. So red means everything that might be red, right? That's exactly what uh, what we're doing when we're doing stimulus equivalence training is that you're trying to teach multiple exemplars so it becomes functional for this person, but then we're also trying to teach these jumps. Um, it's really super, super useful in language development. And yes. we're gonna get into the next next slide, literally ask some questions about that. But um, I think uh, um, Liat's spot on, like you have to, that's one of the really useful features of this is giving these people tools in their world to function <laughs> in their world uh, most easily. It's not like, you know, I hate the idea of, you know, the negative connotation of the behavior mod, but you're modifying their responses, their behavior to be more functional, to give them more access to reinforcers. So uh, that other piece with the generalization, Ryan, it was the peak, what? Peak shift. Oh that God. One. Did, uh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Casey, uh, you, honey. So, what happened? I missed it. I'm in the chat. I'm balls deep in the chat right now. What? Don't be balls uh, deep in anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see, you're scaring me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and Julie Corman, I see you've sent me a private message, but I can't find it. So send it again. <laughs> I'll see if I can find it. Um, so hey guys, uh, if you have questions, um, I'm, I am taking them and copying them into a little um, notepad to ask at the end. Um, so don't worry if it's not, it won't get missed. I'm trying to save them all. If you've posted it to everyone, a question, I'm saving them and uh, copy and pasting them. So no worries. We will let them get through and then we can uh, ask questions at the end. Right. So once gotcha. so everything's presented, you know what I mean? Yeah. It works better that way. 
so peak shift. Um, one of those things that we never talk about in applied world is I've never heard about it until we stuff. dove into this. <laughs> like, so <laughs> I don't even know if I want to get into this. This is like a whole nother conversation. But Wait, what did you uh, say? With, what world? Um, EAB, experimental analysis of behavior, where ABA come from, came from. Oh, I thought you said peak. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, I did. Peak oh, okay. Shift. So, yes. um, so, so, uh, uh, Leah, can you hang up? You show up your two red stimuli for me, please. So she's got two red stimuli. Now the one in her right hand, if we train that as red and we make a stimulus gradient really rigidly steep, right? So you get this really tight stimulus gradient, uh, or stimulus generalization red. gradient. What's that? Meaning that is only red. There is only this one. Is there is only, only one, one red. red. There can be only one. Yes. Right. So um, there can be only one red, and off we go. And the, the rigid rigidity. If the organism sees something that's slightly red, they're like, "No, it's not red." So they won't get reinforced for it um, on either direction of that generalization gradient. Now, what happens over time through experience of the organism is a little thing called peak shift. So I don't know what frequency red is on the color frequency thing, like what wavelength it is, but that frequency will change. The organism will be trained on this stimulus, but over time it'll drift. They call that drifting peak shift. One of the ways that you can help manage that is by flattening your gradient a bit. Teach some good, teach some generalization across the board. Yep. The red is a whole bunch of shit. <clears throat> there's not, there's a lot of things that are red. There's a lot of different versions of red. Um, so teach a broad range of red um, as much. No, as there's as only possible. one red. No. But it's only, <laughs> but it can be only one. Uh, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Photoshop. They'll be okay. like, you oh, go yeah. into Photoshop and you need to match a color identically. It's like, this is this is three four seven nine T K S red. Like, yes. So trials so, might be too tight so, at that point. <laughs> we could name each one, like each RGB value or CMYK value, and that, could, oh, that awesome. would be fun. Yeah, yeah exactly. This is that's slightly red, red. This is red, red, red. This is slightly more red, 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 red. So, anyway, this is red or red, red, so you red. get the idea. So, so peak shift is where an organism actually changes their um, stimulus control over time through the experience of the organism, but drastically uncontrolled. It's just like, they'll just do it. Um, it happens in non-humans. It happens in humans. It's wickedly difficult to deal with um, because you train an organism on a training stimulus and then all of a sudden they're no longer responding to it. You're like, what? <laughs> they were had stimulus control. Stimulus control changes naturally. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And you can think about this on a biological level. We can get into a whole different discussion about why that might be, it might be the case, um, but that's a whole different thing. Rabbit trail. Yeah, um, it happens. I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, let's go back to that last slide on stimulus equivalence, unless there's something else you guys wanted to say. No, you're doing wonderful. I love this. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> oh, shoot. I hit the wrong button. I will say that someone just said that this collab is bigger and better than Jay-Z and Beyonce. Oh my God! That's awesome. <laughs> oh, oh, that's <laughs> amazing! I'm laughing at that one. <laughs> but we we need to get all of these creators in here. Get us yes. all together in one big collab. Yep. I think it'll be fun. It That'd will. Be great. Uh, We're starting the ball going here. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I just saw the peak shift question. I should stop watching the chat because I'm gonna say that's no, really salient to me. Yeah, watch the chat while you teach. Like that's my biggest thing I've learned. Like every time I do it, I'm like. Like, go and back. I she's gone. I got the chat. Don't look yeah. at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm. I'm just sorry, folks. I'm going to minimize the chat because we're, we're writing it all. Through. Through. Okay. <laughs> now we're all okay. chatting and no one's teaching. What's going on? <laughs> 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 and this is why RBT is going to be fun because we have live chats. Um, oh, right. I just want to join it and be in RBT. I just like want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you a we'll give you a free class. You can come in. Fun. You can come and mess with us. So. Each of you gets one free seat. <laughs> I reserve the right to fire you. Um, anyway, so, and Brad's the, the, the instructor of record, not me, so he's in charge. Um, yeah. All right, so this leads to a couple of things. So some of you may or may not be readily familiar with the idea of, well, what is it, the, um, uh, a generalized imitation, right? So you get the idea that imitation is one thing, but it's really more important to get an organism to learn to generalize that, right? To not just imitate one instance, but to imitate all sorts of instances and do it all the time and learn the skill of imitation, right? Um, Brad talks about attending, right? Teaching the skill of attending versus teaching to attend now, 
right? Um, attend on a signal versus attend in general, right? So, so it gets you to the instructional control and all of that fun stuff. So attending is a drastically it. Right. Uh, <laughs> so it's a cusp skill. The interesting thing that I'm wondering about, and I don't really have an answer to this, is equivalence training a skill? Because it seems to be, especially with regard to language, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skirt real carefully on the edge of some RFT stuff, and I'm going to tell you right now I have a bias. Okay? I am not a big Steve Hayes fan for a lot of reasons. Right? He's not a bad person. He does some interesting stuff. Love his writing. Love to read it. Okay, And I've read most of his RFT stuff. I'm just not comfortable teaching it yet. I tend to disagree with some of the basic premises of RFT. That doesn't mean I'm right. Doesn't mean Steve's wrong. Doesn't mean Steve's, it's just in general, I disagree. I'm a scientist, I could be swayed with solid evidence, okay? i not there yet. However, I know there's something weird going on. I tend to be more on the Jack Michael side of multiple control. I tend to think that language development and things like that tends to be along the lines of multiple control. I could be very wrong. I'm not trying to tell you which one's right, which one's wrong, I'm telling you my bias, okay? Um, so when I think of big complex skills like language development. Brad and I were talking about this yesterday for a while. He's like, man, it's crazy. These kids, they learn this, they, they learn this equivalence on a couple of things and then all of a sudden, boom, boom. it takes off <laughs> and it explodes. And I was like, well, what, why isn't it just a skill then? So then we went to the literature and it's like, there might be some evidence. Um, Sidman talked about this in the nineties um, and some other people talked about it as well that maybe teaching an organism to do what we did over there, what we did in the slides, I'm putting over there except where my slides are, what we did in the slides, um, maybe that becomes its own skill. And once you've learned to make that A to C jump and C to A jump, that it becomes easier to do it in the future. Makes some sense to me. It's a question. It's a hypothesis. Yeah. It could be and testable. Um, and there may be an answer that I just don't know about. Yeah, we've, I've seen it in like the clinic or in an in-home program where I'm working my way through an assessment. Let's just pick the ABLES for fun, or VBMAP, one of the popular ones. Uh, you get into these fine, wonderful, discrete trial training style um, skill maps. And uh, I've had several kids where like, once we get like instructional control down and a certain amount of like attending to what we're doing at a table, they start making these jumps across all the skill charts. Like, I haven't done anything. This kid's just figuring it out. Um, so I'm glad I taught you to sit down, have a good life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're you're doing great. Uh, we'll teach language while we're here. Um, but yeah, it's most interesting to see that as a skill piece. So, and there's some interesting talk about this um, at ABAI last year, um, where we were. Oh yeah. We, we sat in. We sat in on that. Is it, Ru, is it Ruiz? Was it? It's Jose Jose Ruiz. Yeah. Y yes. Okay. So Jose Ruiz has got some really interesting stuff on stimulus stimulus relations um, with regard to stimulus equivalence training. What's that? Like Martinez, Ruiz Martinez? Martinez Ruiz? Ruiz Martinez? Did you look at MIT? I have to go to my notes. I'd have to go look. I just remember being in the lecture and being like, what the hell are we talking about? I thought this was stimulus equivalence. So do you guys think, and this is the question that I kind of have. When you get into these um, more advanced uh, clients with like more advanced verbal repertoires, um, do you see like a big difference with stimulus equivalence versus? Yes. And you get into the more RFT with those advanced verbal repertoires, right? Like relating, you know, you see a word and then a whole entire story plays out all these derived relations from that word. And so we're used to teaching learners that might not have a very advanced repertoire, which is where I see stimulus equivalence, you know, the basis A to A, A to B, you know, making sense. Is mm -hmm. that something that you guys see? Right. That's see, a bad question, not a Ryan question. Yeah, yeah. not only C, but uh, the big, the big, like, even though I felt like really confused about what the um, presentation was in Chicago, mm -hmm. I was like, I knew things before I came here. Um, uh, <laughs> Not was, every single day. <laughs> yeah, the big takeaway message that I kind of pulled out of it was, uh, this should be something we're aiming for. Uh, not only is it like important to do all our discrete trials and our table work and this and the other thing, but it should be just as important as generalization with the skill. This should be the, that kind of capitalized next step into uh, pieces to really uh, do stimulus equivalence because he was going into like 20 layers of stimulus equivalence for some of the um, reading pieces he was doing. And I was just like, you can go beyond six. Um, I know I asked so him, I'm was, like, what? I'm like, are you comfortable with the three? And they're like, you need six. I'm like, ah! <laughs> yeah. 
Um, it was totally like, well, while you're programming these, you should be considering all of this. And I was like, sure. And I think, that, I don't know if you have this in your PowerPoint, but is there a way to like show someone like not just the triangle of like ABC? Like what if you have a D or, you know, all the relations that derive, do you know what I mean? Think of, think of each of those stimuli as a set. Okay. Yes. Okay. So if you think of them as sets, and that's the way it's done in the lab, like when you're working with non-humans, you actually don't just work with one stimulus. You work with a whole bunch of stimuli. So there's set A, there's set B, there's set C, there's set D, and then there's response classes. There it so, is. So, so you, not only do you have sets of stimuli, but you have response classes that get paired up, right? So remember, there's a thousand ways to turn on a light switch, and Skinner didn't give two hoots about how you turned on the light switch, just the fact that it was turned on. You could use your butt to turn on a light switch and you, you get the same reinforcer of the light coming on, right? It's more difficult. The response effort might be high, so you're not going to do it very often under certain conditions. You might, but it still fits that response class of flipping on the light bulb. So I think one of the things that often gets missed in our field, especially in the early training level, is that we think so molecularly. Mm -hmm. We think of this rigid, this is how you raise your hand. Put your thumb beside your palm. No, 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 no. There's a bazillion ways to raise your hand. And Skinner argued that our science, which he invented, discovered, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> was molecular. It wasn't, or sorry, was molar, not molecular. So he argued not for molecular level response training. He argued for molar level response training. In other words, response classes are the key. It's all about response classes. So, um, and the same thing that happens with verbal behavior. If you want to understand verbal Skinner's verbal behavior, Again, skipping the RFT stuff because it's interesting, not ready to teach it. And if you want to understand that, you have to understand that those six things that he's talking about are response classes. That's so they're huge. broad, they're Thank huge, there's away. millions of words. Yep, and there's millions yeah. of words that fit in attacked. There's millions of words that fit for a man. You know, so each, it's not one word, like you're training a response class. Um, so the same thing goes with stimulus equivalence training. So you're training a response class. So in this case, we're saying, look at the, 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 the word that says beer, but you're actually training to connect it with different things. That's why I said use different, um, use different stimuli. So use different uh, fonts, use different sizes, different colors, all of those different things to connect where the word, what you want to pair it with. Um, <clears throat> and then how you make the response is also important. Is the response a key breath? Is the response a verbal response? So there's so many different layers to really start to connect. So if I see this, so if I see the picture of a beer and I recognize the word beer, I can hit a button to say congratulations. That was beer. I can hit the beer button, uh, the written word beer button, and get my reinforcer. But wait a minute, what if I had trained the person to 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 read the word? Now you got a whole nother reading. Isn't the behavior in it to itself? It's a whole bunch of behaviors put together. So oh my gosh, now we've got stimulus presented thing, read the word beer, like, yeah, sure, I can teach yeah, you to read the word beer, but yeah. yeah, and then so you got, so this is, it's really hard to break it down to something simple when you think of behavior analyst analysis as a whole being this very molar sort of field. We talk about response classes and stimulus classes. There's a billion types of beer. There's a billion ways to present that image. Um, for for the triangle sake of the, the the of what you see in the books and things like that, that's just unless you're going to have a whole book on it, like I guess the new <laughs> Cooper does. Um, so I will it, say it this: so really testing on task list four. I know a lot of people in here are studying, and um, we're you know we're getting deep right now. The A to A, B yep. to A symmetry, transitivity. You need all of those to yes. demonstrate stimulus equivalence. You must have matched a sample. It's a prerequisite skill in order to even begin this, right? Um, yep. So things to think about. Um, task list five, I am scared a F with this. <laughs> <laughs> like it literally, so stimulus equivalence in chapter two, I mean, um, chap con edition two of Cooper is literally like Brad said, um, uh, it's a page like this big, like uh, the new chapter. You're supposed to derive a lot. Yeah, on your own. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in, in the new Cooper book, it's an entire, it's in multiple locations, but an entire equivalence-based instruction is dedicated. It's over 45 pages long. Um, and it's things I have never heard about. I'm so excited to dive in. I started this morning and got way overwhelmed and was like, Casey, bring it back. <laughs> bring it back. <laughs> Don't go there. Like, we will, you know, we're going to have to get there at some point. This is something we're going to all have to learn. If you're testing on task list five, just pass your freaking exam now <laughs> and then learn it, but don't have to get yeah. tested on it. Um, don't tell them the secrets. I, I know, right? <laughs> um, and so, um, yeah, that was just what I was going to say is that it's just a whole nother, you know, 
and people are asking how many relations are derived in the tr t t traditional triangle, um, which you're gonna, you know, is in Cooper when you have, you've taught um, A to A, you've taught A to B, you've taught B to C, so you've taught three, and then you have derived, you're gonna have going back from B to A. I'll, I'll draw, I could draw your triangle out after if you would like. Yeah, we'll do that after, but um, yeah, so keep going, Ryan, and then we can do that yeah. too, ask questions. You're going. Yeah, no, that's so, a great. Yeah, you're probably... What's that, Brett? Well, just that's a great piece. Uh, one of yeah. my favorite things to do, like especially with uh, answering questions on this topic, uh, to figure out if it's reflexivity, symmetry, transitivity, and ultimately equivalence, right? Uh, is to uh, I started um, writing out. Well, this is stimulus A. I'd identify the stimulus and write A over it. And if I caught it anywhere else to the question, I would write A over it. That way, I could break it down and see it. So if I only had two, I was like, A equals A. I don't even have to read the rest of it, yeah. um, which is great. But doing that for not just the stimulus, but also the responses and just breaking it up that way made it a lot easier uh, than trying to dive into what they were looking for. And when you're reading a question too, like pulling out, is it taught? Okay, is it taught? I'm going to do a solid line. Is it direct? Exactly. Untrained? I'm going to do a dotted line back. And seeing how you're deriving these relations when you get test questions like this, drawing this shit out, I can't do it in my head. Like No. You have to draw it out. It's so important, and we teach that. It's like, get your whiteboard if you're in the exam, and if you're practicing, practice on a whiteboard. Practice these questions of drawing out your stimuli. Casey, I, I love the fact that you're using an, an, uh, a stimulus equivalence relation to describe how you learn about stimulus equivalence relations. There's a certain irony in that, and I love it. Yeah, I love it too. We will draw it out after, absolutely. We'll let Ryan finish up here what he's got, because this is golden. Um, and then we'll all do some questions and draw some shit. And Sweet. So. So the last point that we'd like to make when I talk about this stuff is, I think I have these questions flipped around here. Is it uniquely human? Is it how language works? The answer is we don't know. I think we're getting closer. Um, I think that you're getting some consilience, some sciences are coming together. Um, but what we do know is that it's definitely not uniquely human, okay? So we know that some non-human organisms will display stimulus equivalence at the transitivity level. It's very rare. It's not a consistent effect. Is it spurious? Is it like an accident? Like did the organism just figure it out by chance and like got lucky? Maybe, but it's been shown a few times in non-humans, um, but it's very, very, very unlikely to be demonstrated. Um, it has been, it's been shown like once or twice in the literature on pigeons. Um, and then I think it's been shown a couple of times with other uh, um, uh, non-human primates, but it's a question mark as to whether or not it's really there or if it's just, some artifact of the training and maybe it was lucky. It, it, not quite sure. So I'm not gonna put enough stock in it to say, yes, definitely it's, it's not uniquely human or definitely it is uniquely human. It's right on that edge, which interestingly enough, matches up to the concept of language, right? Humans ability to use language, the generativity and all of that fun stuff that exists with our language and the ability to make the connections, verbal connections um, to, to relevant stimuli very quickly and readily and all of the fun stuff that goes along with language, that is also like on the edge of uniquely human, right? We've, you've seen some of the work with some of the um, bonobos and um, Kanzi and all, all of those critters that we've done some language development with, but it's not 100% scientifically convincing that we pulled it off. It's like, that's a neat trick. Like either you're right on the edge and you've got it and the organism just doesn't quite have the processing power to say this, to use the right term. The biology just isn't quite there, right? Um, to, to, to do the full blown language stuff. Maybe it is uniquely human. Maybe it's a sliding scale. Um, but the two that, the, the thing that sticks out to me with Somebody corrected me in the in the um, chat. Thank you very much. I love it when that happens. Um, is it Jose Martinez Diaz. That's it. So Jose Martinez Diaz. Dang, um, so, so you all got me corrected there, which is perfect. Thank you. Um, so, so the thing that really stuck with me from his presentation last year was that it kind of clicked. I was like, hmm, I wonder if this is that connecting piece. Is this a thing that we have found? that might differentiate human species from other species. In my training, I've always asked the other question, what's similar? What's similar between humans and non-humans? And the reason I ask that question is because that's the core question that we work with in behavior. If you can find the common principles across all species, and it holds across all species, you probably got yourself something that's pretty real, right? It's a type of um, 
systematic replication. So you do your work, you do your replications with the pigeons, you move on, you systematically replicate it with the rats, you move on, you systematically replicate it with the dogs and the crickets and the fish, and eventually you get to humans and you play around with humans and wow, cool. If you're getting these effects across all those different species, you probably got a pretty darn reliable effect on something well described and well understood. But there are things that are uniquely human and uniquely shark, and uniquely whatever. Um, so maybe this is that thing. And this is where I have to give myself some grace to understand that I don't know everything. And that's why I don't teach on RFT yet, because I don't know enough about it to know, to argue with it, against it, for it. I don't, I, I'm not there. I don't understand it fully. So uh, maybe this, uh, but my guess is, having done the reading I have done, that equivalence relations um, at this level, transitivity, um, is probably something that's pretty damn uniquely, <laughs> like it's right on that edge. Like I yeah. want to say it's uniquely human. I want to say this is the thing that gives us the ability to do language. And maybe we can train it on other species, but um, maybe not. I don't know. We'll get there. Maybe we find a rat that does it someday. I don't know. Or a I love what you said about grace. I talked about that this morning in the morning meeting is allowing yourself grace, like that you don't know everything and that it's okay. And like, just yeah. keep studying and always wanting to be learning and growing in the field. Um, and that, you know, Sometimes I don't want to ask a question to these guys because I feel stupid, right? And then I'm like, and Leah's like, screw it, just ask. And I'm like, yeah. oh, or she'll just do it for me. And I'm like, and then we start a conversation and we just riff off of it and learn so much. And um, it's just a cool. You know what? Because every time I asked a question that I thought was like, okay, this is going to sound really stupid. <laughs> why is like, why is avoidance considered negative reinforcement? Isn't that an antecedent? And <laughs> Ryan's like, exactly. <laughs> It is really stupid. And I'm like, I'm so fucking smart that I thought it was <laughs> One of my- Tandem schedule. Tandem schedule. I taught it wrong for so long. Oh. So did I. Like, <laughs> it doesn't we made, matter. We mistakes on the it channel. does. We deleted stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of videos where like, that's wrong. We're like, oops, click. We were um, going to stop <laughs> uploading like our new collectives and just stick with like last collective as like our bundle and then we're like no we're because we learn stuff every time and so we just keep uploading the new videos because they only get great. better <laughs> yep. so one of my favorite things just kind of on the topic of asking questions is i like to tell uh, all my supervisees and rbt is that the only dumb question you have is the one you don't ask yep, yep. Oh my there god you, go. you guys have so much in common she said that last time work husband and wife <laughs> all right um as liath bring up uh her screen to draw i will ask this question um and this is for Ryan, because I don't really understand it. Um, <laughs> or Brad. <laughs> how can you tell how many, oh wait, I think we're going to talk about this. How can you tell how many relations will emerge or derive if there's more than two stimuli being trained? That's You're beyond me. Yeah, I'm like, mm. that's That's a very complex question. I'm going to have to refer you to something probably a little bit more current than my brain. And that's okay um, so, because, again, if you're studying for this exam on this task list, like, um, I would, you know, you'd have to really draw this out again. So you're going to have to add in these stimuli and draw it all out to see what exactly is being trained and derived in this, in the question. Um, also, someone saw a question where if one of the stimuli are auditory, then not all relations will emerge. Have you heard that mm. or no? There was a bit on that in the um, in the Diaz talk. Um, yes, you you run into the the blocking and masking effect, um, and we just kind of leave it at that. Like because, I, again, you, oh, yeah. the depth of my the depth of my knowledge on stimulus equivalence uh, is probably not as much as what you might expect it to be. be um, it's really it's a very new field. <laughs> In the sense yeah, of the depth you, that's you, coming out um, now, it's very wow. current. I graduated in 2005, so we did we yeah. hardly talked about this at all in the EAB or my ABA classes. Um, it was not like whatever. Here's the thing, like so I haven't done as much follow up on it, um, and a lot of this is coming out now. And so when Casey was telling me this morning about the 40 pages, I'm like, oh god, I do have to read all of it. Oh my god, wait like, till you see it. You're um, gonna like. I think we need to actually like come out to Spokane and the four of us like really like sit and just have coffee and like study it and talk it out because me reading it alone I don't think right now is like it'll get me a basis but being able to like or even if we just meet on zoom and like yeah chat it yeah. out because there's a lot of things that I've never heard of and some cool graphics no. and you know it gets into the novel responses which you know yeah. with peak like if a jib is a jag yeah. and a jag is a peg and a 
peg is a picture of a house. It's like, that's how you get into real teaching when you can do it with novel things that you don't yeah, have right. any prior history of learning, right? You've never yep. seen this word or related it to this thick picture. And that's, that's getting into how this is a skill. Yes. Yeah, and that's, that's a skill. I, I th and that's where you start to really get into the importance of generalization. I, I think we really skip the importance of generalization. And when you start to think about <clears throat> preparedness of a species, um, and think of, I'm going to sidetrack everybody here for a second, but think of the difference between punishment and reinforcement. Reinforcement has a wickedly broad effect. When you reinforce one behavior, you're not reinforcing one, you're re reinforcing a whole bunch. And it's almost yes. like you're reinforcing a response class. Surprise, yep. surprise. When you punish, you're not punishing a class. You're punishing this weird, into very narrow response. It's like the species, humans, are trained, are, are not trained, but are born with this broad building of behavior built in and narrow slicing of behavior out. So generalization is this absolutely core thing that might be part of any organism that demonstrates operant conditioning. And I think that's where you, we might be going with this, right? Yeah. Like, Operant conditioning is really about this really broad sort of ability to learn and make connections. And then nature comes along and slices little pieces out. Well, that was a bad connection. You're not supposed to eat that kind of leaf. Keep eating leaves, just not that kind of leaf. Don't wipe you know, with that. Um, <laughs> thing <girl. Yes. laughs> right? So, and I think that's important to remember. And I think that's where we're get, eventually getting with stimulus equivalence and where my understanding of it is probably pretty minimal um, in terms of where it's gone and what can be done with it. Um, but it, it, to me, it makes sense that it's much broader and has much bigger sort of play than what, uh, um, than, than, than what it doesn't, if you will. It's, I, think it's big, I think it's a big issue. So. Yeah, it's going to be a huge change for sure. And I'm uh, really excited to learn it. And I like how you picked those stimuli to go along with what we're talking about, Liat. All okay, right. I want to tell you guys that, first of all, when you're studying, you guys don't realize that you're engaging in some stimulus equivalents too, right? So yep. you learn something, you're like positive reinforcement. Okay, something's added that increases the future frequency of behavior. And then one day you come to class and you're like, oh my God, type one reinforcement is positive reinforcement, right? So reflexivity is A equals A, this equation up here. So over here, this would be saying that positive reinforcement equals positive reinforcement. That's that match to sample. And now, can you tr do a legend of a trained and untrained? And also, guys, you hop in if we're not doing something correctly, okay? Yeah, we might, great. we're not sure. All right. Well, hopefully we are. We do it enough. <laughs> People have passed the exam after taking our course. That's a good thing. <laughs> You, have yeah. some. you guys have a course. We just have videos. Like, here, let's go spew shit. Yeah, right. what you want. Drive your own damn relations. We're not going to manage you. Train yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. And everyone's, we're getting, I'm getting so much good feedback how much they are loving this, guys. So thank you. All right. So you train, right? A equals A. That's your first training, like Ryan was saying. You got to train. So you draw a line from A equals A. That's mm -hmm. one trained. And then Without training, they can match, again, match the sample, A equals A. So that's an untrained relation, a derived relation. I don't draw that out, right? You can do that, uh, yeah. You, come on, you put a key on there, now you're not doing anything. You're, you're making well, my A's. Okay, okay, fine, so it goes this way. Oh, whoops, wrong. Okay, Speaking of this, go. this is one of the relations. You're, you're training oh, A to oh, A, oh, and then oh, they're oh, deriving oh, A to A. So you, if I teach you positive reinforcement, same as positive reinforcement, ignore that there's a period there. It should be the exact same, okay? then you could figure, oh, positive reinforcement is the same as positive reinforcement, Pretend right? that our stimuli are equivalent. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> I love the fun. All right, there, there's, there's number one. Next. Dude, I just got a potential spam from Spokane, Washington. Dudes. A what? Potential spam phone call from Spokane, Washington. Well, we sold out of spam at Costco here, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. all right. Wow. Now, Liat's going to draw a line down what? from A to B. Now we're getting into symmetry. We're training. Again, this is our training setting. So when you come to class and I tell you that, oh my God, positive reinforcement is the same as type one reinforcement. I'm training. This makes you really happy that we're showing this training piece. You've got to train, guys. That's yeah. true. I mean, it, you, we're going to get shit for free, but not before we do some steps that are really important, right? We got to teach. We're not magicians. 
Although some of BCBs think they are. Um, now, <laughs> we have a video. We have a video planned for that. That it's yeah. <laughs> cool. So now in the Whatever again, to do it. when without training at all, they can derive B equals A. We're going back up. This is our first demonstration of symmetry. Untrained. Boom. There you go. Now we have two derived relations. We're killing it right now. Now you are going to, Liat's going to teach you that in the presence of type 1 reinforcement, it also is R plus, right? It's the same as that. Casey, okay. Casey, can I ask a quick question real quick? Can you just save it until we get through this because I'm on a roll and then you can absolutely. <laughs> um, I don't want to lose my train of thought because I feel like I'm on fire. Um, so she's going to draw a train. We're in a training setting again. Now we're training another stimuli. We're training B to a third stimuli C, okay? Boom. Now, in the presence of just R plus, they're also matching it to type one reinforcement. So now we have an untrained derived, we have another demonstration of symmetry here. Oh, and untrained. What? And then, here we go, the true test for stimulus equivalence, hashtag final test, hashtag crucial, is can they go from R plus and match it to positive reinforcement, untrained, untrained. We don't train them, we're not reinforcing them, untrained. So now we have a derived relation from C to A. I'm sorry, one sec, am I on red? Yes. And then guess what? They still have to do A to C. They have to match that. They have to know that that's the same in the presence of that. So now that's two more derived relations, sorry, okay? No. So we've trained three and we've got one, two, three, four, five for free. Does this look correct, Ryan? I would argue four because the first one is not a, there's no, there's no guess. That's what yeah. I was thinking. So four so for free. I, I the it. very first one, there's not a dotted line. I wouldn't though. Okay. I was going back and forth with that. Just off but whatever. Board. Like I get your point. It's just that it's yeah. identical stimulus. So there's nothing new to learn. Like it's. Can't derive anything. It so let's go back is. and erase that first one. The one from the red. So now we have we've train trained three, you get four. Yeah. You get four for free. That's yeah. your drive. Yeah. I'm gonna type that. Train three, get four. Yo. Oh, I sent to someone private. This is cool. Like when you're studying, guys, I hope I mean and people are like, oh, this is for kids with autism. Which like nope. yeah. Like you're doing this shit all the time. Only once you understand yeah. something and so you're using stimulus equivalent, you're using stimulus generalization, realizing, wow, all these things should evoke the same response of me clicking, I mean, or, you know, anything with any of these words should be me choosing whatever answer it is, or stimulus discrimination involved. Like, okay, this, even though extinction decreases the behavior, this is not punishment, right? Like in general, we're using all of these when we're learning. And I spell equivalent wrong. It looks so wrong. Yeah, it's dirty. Yeah. Right? You even pointed at it. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a stimulus prompt. <laughs> it would be an A. Equivalence? I just so, Vardamir, um, we don't count the ones that we taught. Those are just taught relations, right? Yes. There's a difference between taught relations, which you have to do. You have to, be, you have to do training, like Ryan was saying with the beer. And then you're going to get these derived, which means in the presence of no training, right? No further training, that is, no further training. Um, I, I wonder if it's better to think of it as you test for the opposite to see if it happens. Yes. Uh, that way, it because right now you get in the conversation, it can be confusing of, well, we're training for A to B, and then we're training for B to A. And really, it's more like, we trained A to B, we're going to test for B to A. And again, it's going to depend on the question. I don't know what the question is. So if it's asking about how many relations are derived with symmetry or versus yeah. sensitivity versus full stimulus equivalence, you know, there's yeah. going to be a difference in that. Um, so, so straight up symmetry, you get you, straight up symmetry. You have to teach two. You have to teach, teach A to A, then you teach A to B. You get a free one. You get B to A. Yeah. So you get one derived relation out of that. Um, then, and then again, then you move on from there. So. To answer the, there are people popping up with questions about the fact that about the with multiple stimuli thing. Just keep drawing these triangles. It's not something I could do in my head. Like yeah. I don't have it memorized yet. Like they get fourteen. I don't know. 
<laughs> right? You have to really like look at the question. Oh, yeah. it's B, and what does B connect with? What happens if there's a B hat or a B prime, and it connects? They both connect with C's. Is that a generalization? Do you get some extra derived relations there? And maybe it depends on if it's a response class or a stimulus class. And oh. So someone said derived multiple. relations are not reinforced. So I, I think that what Ryan had said before, Correct. that you can, you don't right. have to. Right. If you, they, they will develop automatic, like they will develop automatically. That's how you know that you got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't demonstrate it with re using a reinforcer. So if you go out and teach C to A, then you don't, you're not demonstrating. The, you're teaching you're it. Not you're not it. testing it. Right. You're not, you're right. You're teaching it. You're not testing it. So once, it, once it's been demonstrated, then of course you're going to reinforce it. Like, yes, <laughs> that would be like me calling this thing a cup. Like, congratulations. I can title it a cup. Yes. Reinforce for all. Of, I've never called it a cup before. Well done. It's a cup. Like, yay. Good job. Like you're going to reinforce it, but to show it, no, you don't, you know, for, to get the, to show stimulus equivalence and to get that transitivity piece, you have to allow it to be derived. You have to allow the organism to do it. If the organism does it on their own, congratulations, they have the ability to do it on their own. Now you got yourself another training tool in your kit, right? So you know that the kid or the adult, the dog, the dog, whatever you're working with can do it, right? So you have to allow them to do it. And then you can, then of course you're gonna reinforce it because they got the right answer. You're not gonna punish them for saying cup. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm like, this is what uh, this is what yeah. Cooper left out in the first this last edition. It's like, come on, Coop, <laughs> fix it. Like, <laughs> Jenna Rose, you want to ask a question, and then the, the next girl, um, LaRonda can. I'm just trying to keep everyone in order. All right, Jenna, hit it if you're here. Sure. Um, so I was just wondering um, if one of the stimuli are auditory and not visual. Um, how many will be derived because? That's something that I came across a lot um, in the mock exams because since it's a match to sample procedure, all the stimuli have to be presented at once. So what if one of the stimuli is auditory, oh, yeah. like a spoken word? I drew that out here, kind of. Um, I erased the positive reinforcement. One. You're saying like if it was like a picture of a cat to a cat, then you teach a picture of a cat is the same as a spoken word cat? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So, if you put three, um, go ahead. If you put three spoken words and you play them at the same time, it's called. Oh, no, no, no. So say <laughs> um, you, you train which which? somebody that the spoken word red was the same as um, a card with a red on it, and then um, the top um, stimulus A would be red objects, and then B would be a red card. So how many relations would derive? from that if you're dealing with an auditory stimulus where they're not all visual. Now is that, I don't, I haven't heard of that as more, as any different. I thought that's the same in terms of like what I drew out here. This is a picture of a cat versus someone saying the word cat versus the written word cat. There's a question in the BDS module yeah, that yeah, you're referring you know to, right? Jenna, yeah, Jenna, so. I think, wait, Ryan's gonna talk guys. Okay. <laughs> That doesn't mean shut up. It means go ahead and talk over me. Um, <laughs> Jenna, I think, are you getting at the fact that like if you present multiple stimuli, auditory stimuli concurrently, that they're going to garble? And you're not so going to be able to identify which one? Because that's a different issue. If there's two visual stimuli, but one of them is auditory, then how many relations will derive? Which, at, at where? Is the auditory stimulus A, B, or C? Um, I think it was C. Okay. The answer, I think the core answer, I could be wrong. Don't get me wrong. I think the core answer is depending on how you design the set, design how you set it up, you would have the same number of relations. Like it doesn't matter. The type, the type of stimulus doesn't matter. However, you, early on, you said something really important, which was in order to do good match to sample, you have to present everything concurrently, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have three auditory stimuli that you're trying to train, you're going to present those concurrently. They're all going to garble. You can't hear which one's which. So you would have to make them independent. So it, does that qualify? I don't know. So I'm not really sure the answer to your question. It kind of depends on where you put that auditory stimulus. Um, and, and if you want to follow a rigid match to sample, like I would do it is hit the play button, hit the play button, hit the play button, choose which one was the appropriate verbal response, auditory stimulus. Okay, yeah. Because then I, um, I also came across a question that was, um, you're teaching a child money skills and you teach them that to match um, a picture of a dollar bill to a dollar bill, 
which is already equal to four quarters and a picture of a dollar on it. And then it was asking how many relations are going to be derived. And I'm sorry to be asking these questions, no. but no, but I got to be real with you. Those BDS stickle as equivalence questions. I get like, I literally am like, huh? Like, there are such things that it's not right, but I'm just saying like, I think sometimes they're deeper than the test. Not that you don't want to know further knowledge, but right. I, I've read them and I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bill so. is adding to the conversation here saying that the auditory stimulus can't be symmetrical because there wouldn't be another one to match it to. I'm just reading more. You train them to match a red card when they hear a verbal stimulus red. You can't reverse it. Yeah. Unless you teach them to say, like they have to have that in their repertoire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're going to think of those things a lot. Like, can they man? Can they tap yet? Like, we're teaching this as we're doing this too, you know? There's a lot of teaching that goes into this whole, and that's why there's a new chapter called Equivalence-Based Instruction, which is going to be a yeah. new part of Section D of your behavior change considerations. It's not just going to be stimulus equivalence. It's a whole new world here, guys, uh, that we, again, are still dive just literally opened the book today, um, but we're teaching the stimulus equivalence that um, Chasselis 4 in Cooper Edition 2 is, um, is using. But Jenna, don't, don't be scared. That literally petrifies me. I know exactly what you're talking about on those questions. And I, Thank you, Leah. Uh, not that they're, they're way smarter than me on that. So like maybe they can tell you more, but those questions, I'm like, I... Uh, we've talked about that a lot. Like the four of us, we like, we'll, we'll send questions back and forth to each other and be like, yeah, bad question. Like, <laughs> it is so... Like it doesn't mean that the question's wrong or it's trying to get at something wrong or anything like that. But sometimes there are bad questions and sometimes people are, they get it. They're like, Hey, that makes sense to me. And I'm like, yeah, I don't understand. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so again, give the test creators, a, you know, some grace, do your best, get some support, look at it from different angles, look at it from different resources, talk to Leah and Casey. And also guys, if you're taking um, questions um, like BDS or mock exam, just make sure you're getting ones with feedback too, because um, I know BDS does get feedback. And so really diving into that feedback, going yep. to the page of Cooper, they tell you to go to and dive into that feedback. Because yep. if you just take a mock that has no feedback, you're just kind of, you're just kind of, ah, what? <laughs> What's the point of that? There's no learning uh, there happening. So just be 